Hey, Brian. What's going on? Hey, Brian. Yes. I, uh, wow. What an absolute trip. What an yes. absolute honor to talk to you. Um, I grew up loving your movies, so thank you so much for doing this. Okay, what's up? What's happening? <laughs> what's Red River? What's Red River? So Red River, we named the podcast after the uh, radio station in uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre. So in right. Texas, okay. I, I didn't know that. Yeah. Neither did we. And uh, one, one of our <laughs> one of our co-hosts uh, named it that and I thought it was great. So we went with it and uh, it, it just seemed to make sense. So um, Red River episode number 71 or 72. We we welcome uh, Brian Usna. Um, last episode, I got to talk to Steve DeJarnat uh, because he made one of my favorite movies, which was Miracle Mile. And now. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it's amazing to talk to you. You've made so many, like, I I've seen your movies for the last 20, 30, like 20, 30 years. We, we kind of just want to celebrate your catalog. Like I said, we're just beyond fans in the very beginning. I, I know that it's, 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 you were born in like the Philippines, but then you moved around a lot. So yeah. what I, th- what I thought to myself was like in all those movings from like Panama and like everywhere that you lived, um, how did that influence like your movie intake? Um, I think that um, it influenced, well, you know, you don't really start going to, well, before there was video and iPads and stuff. And, and believe it or not, I kind of was in grammar school when there was hardly TV. I mean, there wasn't television until I was like in the fourth or fifth, fourth grade or something not even TV. And that was just a few hours. So you can see that's, you know, but they didn't show movies on TV then. So it's not like, you know, you had to go to a movie theater to see a movie and you didn't tend to go until, you know, it was not a real common thing. And as I got older, as I got to be more like nine, eight, nine, 10, 11, especially middle school, which we, Back then, it was called junior high. Um, there, it was. Um, I went to a lot of movies then because once I was in, once I was like in, in the sixth grade, seventh grade, I was allowed to roam freely. You know, I was. Um, you know, I don't even know if I told anybody where I go, and I would go see, um, you know, five movies a weekend. You know, back then you could get a double feature for 35 cents in Puerto Rico if they were the reruns, you know, and the high end, if you saw a real first run for adults, it would be like 75 cents, which is misleading because, you know, a Pepsi Cola was a nickel. So (laughs) do the math and, you know, you know, a, a Jaguar XKE was like five grand, you know, a Volkswagen was like 1600 (laughs) bucks. No, but, but you see, it's the money. The money is different now. But course, how, how much? So how, it sounds. How much was a bucket of popcorn? Well, they didn't have that. Uh. You know, <laughs> I, no, no, they did have popcorn, but they but they came in small amounts. Okay, all right. so it wasn't it wasn't like you. It's not like today where everything is like huge. You yeah. know, at Disney, it's like Wall-E, right? Yeah. <laughs> That's why I love this way. Disneyland with the cart because you're too fat to walk. <laughs> and you got to have your big bucket and your big gulp. And it, it wasn't it wasn't like that. People didn't they just didn't have that mentality. That's okay. Why. You got to. I remember when I lived in Panama. Um, when I was, you know, I spent seven years there. It's kind of like all of, you know, from 
kindergarten through up to the sixth grade. So I kind of grew up there. And this is a third world country, very undeveloped. But I, and I lived in Panama City, but I went to school in the canal zone, which was sort of the American part. And um, if I saw a movie there, you know, where I took swimming lessons, for example, in Balboa, um, it wouldn't be like, a, it would be not, a, not like a movie palace. It's like a big room kind of they made, like a little auditorium they made into a screening room. And the popcorn came in, you know, it was kind of like this size, you know, like a, you know, like a little paper, you know, you know paper thing. Yeah. But really small. It wasn't very big, but it didn't seem bad at all. You know, okay. and it was. And when I went to the movies, I would get, I would eat a lot of candy bars. <laughs> okay. Yeah. You know, and but it was, um, you know, I saw when I was able to go by myself, I saw um, a lot of movies. When I was much younger, we would only go either on a real rare special occasion when I was in grammar school, that like my family would go. Or on Sundays, we would go to the matinee, the kids matinee at the local theater. Now this is all Spanish kids, you know. And, um, but the movies would be in English, which all the movies had subtitles in, in, in Spanish. And so we would go and it would be on Sundays for, I forget, it was like a quarter or something which today, I don't know what it would be like, three bucks or 350. And um, we, would, we would see like a Three Stooges cartoon and a Rocket Man serial and, uh, or a Batman one or, and a, a, a trailer and a couple of movies, you know? It would be like a mix, mix of stuff. And that's actually, so that would be our Sunday. That would be where, me and my brothers and sisters, of which I had five, um, we would just walk over there and, and spend a few hours with the other kids. You know? Did you? But they had. What was it? Was ahead. it something like as as far as like cinema? Was it something that you always loved? Because like when you're, you know, movies making a movie seems like such an undertaking. I would imagine. Yeah, uh, it, it's funny. I never could have thought that I could make them at all. I mean, that was just I didn't know. You know. But I loved them because it was so immersive. And I think everybody does. I don't, you know, anybody, I mean, now I don't know what people think. My grandkids, from the time they're three, they're looking at Peppa Pig on their, on their um, iPad. iPad. I mean, they, there's so much media. I mean, so I don't think it's the same thing at all. Going to a movie theater when you don't have all that technology and all you've got is radio and um, people telling stories, um, which we used to do in the dusk. Kids would tell these ghost stories that would be really scary, right? People crawling out of graves and stuff. Did, and, did, um, oh, yeah. I was, I'm sorry. I was just going to say, so did, was horror something that you always loved? I did. I was attracted to it. And I'm not sure why I used to think that it's because I was, um, because I saw a horror movie at this matinee um, at the, at the Lux theater um, when I was very, yeah, I think I was six or something. And I saw the creature with the Adam brain. I don't know if you know that movie, Yes. but um, I mean, it, it, it traumatized me. <laughs> you know, it was a zombie movie, you know, and, um, and it, and I couldn't sleep, you know, and it was, you know, a big deal. And my mother swore we would never go to that theater again <laughs> if there's no such stuff. And then, of course, we still did, you know, and then there was a few others as I grew up, you know, I think the, um, the ones that stand out to me are like the seventh voyage of Sinbad. Oh, wow. Mm. Yeah. You know, okay. Yeah. Um, the William Castle stuff, um, you know, I would see um, at first just the, the trailers to like the hammer, like Horror of Dracula stuff. And that was really heavy because it had actual red blood and breasts, you know, yes. and that. 
And and other movies that were kind of like horror movies to me were, were and really influenced me were the biblical epics like um, Ben Hur and um, the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments is like a horror movie. There's all this magic with the turning the water into blood and snakes into sticks and and then sending out the green mist to kill all the children and and then you know the special effects of the water and then the orgy at the end which I think was what made me think that every movie should end in a big kind of orgy of something. You know, you, you know what you're you did right. one of the best ones of all time. <laughs> well, but I think I, I really think, you know, I as I as I got older, as I started making as I started being able to actually make a living making movies, I started trying to look for why I did why I made certain scenes where it came from because I don't think anybody especially in movies, I think music's the same, or nothing comes from nowhere. Nothing mm. comes just, it, everything you do is based on something you've seen or heard or, you know, something that came before and then you process it and That's, put it out in your own I, specific way. And I, so even, the, I think the, the kind of the, you know, the, the okay new wave or French type direct, what we think of, of like arty directors or, or European directors, they tend to, and today Americans are very much like that, but they tend to look at film uh, kind of in a very formalistic way. And they had this idea that film is, you know, that there's an author to a movie, which is their word is auteur. That's just the French word for author. And, um, and they think that's the director. Uh, I disagree. I think that there's, I think it's more like the witches around the brew in Macbeth. I think it's, I've always, yeah, somebody's can be very important. Usually it can be the director, but it can also be, it doesn't have to be him. I think when you, you know, it, people, everybody, there's always a handful of people who have a great deal of influence and in what a movie is when you watch the, the Joel Silver movies of the 80s and 90s, um, he would just hire directors that would do whatever he told them to, you know? And you kind of, and they would have, you know, sometimes directors, it's the studio or it's the producer who has, it's making their movie, you know? Uh, so, but anyway, that idea that they had the auteur theory or the auteur kind of tendency is to be very aware of the antecedents of the movies you're making. It's to, to know the history of movies, to know movies. And then what they do a lot is that they will act, they'll do like homages, but they will use, they will quote movies. So you'll see somebody like Luc Besson in The Professional axing a door and he does it with the exact same treatment as Jack Nicholson does in The Shining. Yeah. But he's he's doing it consciously. He's conscious. And when I worked, I really learned this when I worked with um, Christoph Gans. Uh, you know, uh, you know who Christoph is. He's a, he's a, he's a big French director. But I produced his his first short, his first short in Necronomicon and his okay. first film, which is Crying Freeman which nobody's seen in this country, but due to a battle between the producer and the distributor. I, I was trying, I was trying, shown. I was trying to watch it. I was trying, he got, he, yeah. Yeah, it's really, it's really a, a tremendous movie. Uh, but anyway, Christoph was a critic in, in France. A lot of critics will become directors. And so with Necronomicon, he did the first episode, the one that was very like the best Roger Corman Poe movie you ever saw, you mm. know? And, but everything he did was referencing other movies. Like when he would go back to Paris, when we were working together it, from, when he would fly back from LA, he would fill a suitcase with, with um, laser discs. Cause back then laser disc was as good as it got. Yeah. And he just, he would, take back 30, 40 laser discs, you know, whatever would fit. 
and he watched them all and he knows it all. And so everything he does on screen or used when he started was based on certain movies. And after working with him, I tried that a little with the dentist. I tried um, referencing, I had, I had never done a body count movie before where the dentist had to kill like five people or more. And so I didn't know what, and it's very limited and it's not dark, it's all brightly lit. And, and you know, it was not, it wasn't some, a kind of movie that I was, um, you know, I like to just do the weird stuff. And this was <laughs> like more of a traditional yes. kind of, you know, that, stepfather type of thing. And very, so what I did, so I did try that. I tried getting, um, I tried, I looked at all these Hitchcock movies and picked these killing scenes and adapt, use their structure for the killings. So, you know, doing it consciously is one thing, but I think mostly people do it unconsciously because they just don't know where it's coming from. Like I didn't, you know, if I, when I tried to figure out why the hell did I want to have these melding bodies in society? You know, where did that idea come from? And then when I thought about it, I thought, wow, I kind of can bring it all the way back to, um, to um, Dr. X, the movie that was, that um, what's his name directed right before um, the um, mystery of the wax museum and um, had all same almost, I mean, it had Faye Ray in it and it had, um, I forget the name of the director. I'll look it up. Um, yeah. Michael Curtis. Yeah. Curtis. Curtis. He's, yeah. He's yeah. one of the great Hollywood directors. And um, I think Scorsese's favorite. Right. But, but Dr. X is not a good movie, whereas Mystery of the Wax Museum, I think, is, you know, the 30, what is it, 33 version. Okay. Um, but Dr. X has one color sequence, which, which is Dr. X, the gimmick is he has this synthetic flesh and he puts it on in space and stuff. And it's sort of like, it's kind of morphous skin. And I think that made an impression that I, if I think back, that's kind of where that goes, you know, that's where I can lead it to. Of course, it's conditioned by the script and the fact that um, we were, and the fact that this was the eighties when the rubber guys, the, the effect, rubber effects guys were just going bananas with all these new plastics and these our, new our, our know, favorite our favorite <laughs> yeah well i mean it was a whole period and and you know i would i didn't i loved the original nightmare on elm street i don't care for really any of the others but i would see every one because it, they were showcases for what can you do with rubber <laughs> you know, what what can you pull off and and so i think that I mean, it, there's lots of influences, but I think everybody's like that. As they say, the language of film is film, you know? Yeah. You, you, how you tell a story you get from somewhere else. And that's why I think one reason why Reanimator was, was kind of so remarkable because it was less the language of film than the language of theater because Stuart Gordon was already a veteran of the theater of theater directing. He did outrageous stuff. He was the artistic director of the organic theater in Chicago. And he did all kinds of stuff and horror and sci-fi and just funny stuff. And, and he really knew how to direct. How'd you, meet, how'd you meet him? So when um, a friend that sort of was my, the guy who kind of introduced me to LA, Bob Greenberg, was a, um, he, I was looking for a director, Steve DeJarnet, I tried, I, would, I first came to do a short film about a, um, that Kim Deitch had actually drawn the script for me, an adaptation, he's an underground cartoonist. And um, it was about a, a um, convict uh, on death row who, who, um, who was incarnated as a, um, as a very famous potato, 
you know. So it's kind of a weird kind of thing, you know. And and um, we did special effects tests, and and Bob Greenberg helped me. And I was looking for a director, and that's why I came out. I put an ad in in Weekly Variety that said director wanted for horror movie, and I just got all these letters. This is this is pre fax times. Yeah, yeah. Before the fax machine, and um, and so. One of the the guy that I really liked was Steve DeJarnett. He had this short film, black and white, kind of a noir thing called Tarzana. Yeah, yeah, and I yeah. really loved it. Yeah. He, but he was doing bigger things then, so I always remember him. That's from funny. That, cool, you know? cool. Yeah, I'm going to tell him. I'm going to tell him. And, and I also and I also always remember that at the first film, the one of the first film festivals I was ever invited to. It was the first one for society was at Sichez, which is just south of Barcelona. It's a huge one now. And um, and I took society and and it law and they gave the best special effects prize to um, Miracle Mile instead of society, which I thought was oh. just amazing. <laughs> I mean, come on. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, uh, that, that's... that's, was, that's that... You just, you kind of look at that and you go, well, I don't know. <laughs> you know? <laughs> that's crazy. I don't know how they get from A to B on that, but that's, yeah. the way, that's the way juries are, as we're finding out in the U.S. Capitol even today. Yeah. Yes. You just, you know. I, I, uh, I, I got to say, you know, just, you know, reanimator like to come out of the gate with that so you meet up with stewart and it's like what an iconic well, bob movie. told me bob told me i should meet stewart okay because first i tried first i tried to make a bit a feature film based on the script that deitch had written had drawn actually and um and i and bob greenberg took me around la and kind of kind of gave me the layout of the land for independence. You know, he had gone to USC film school and, and so he took me to my first movie set. My first one was a Jim Wynorski movie. Oh. <laughs> Quite close to where I live right now. And, um, and, I, and I went to, and I went on to studio lots and I met people and I started meeting the people like me that were trying to do independent stuff. And when I then I met the Albert Band, who was Charlie and Rick Richard's father, um, and on the oh. set of Sword Kill, you know, and his son Charlie was just starting a um, just starting a company called Empire. Empire, yeah, which was a sales company. And so when I met them, I said, "Listen, I'll put up the money to develop this if, you, if we can make it." And so I did, but they never spent any, they just kept the money and just didn't do anything, right? And so then I finally went, wow, I'm never getting this money back. So I'll just, I'll just make my own movie. I'll just do something else. And then Bob said, I should go, I should meet Stuart. So I went to Chicago over Thanksgiving weekend in um, 80, 83. And it was just a month before I moved my family to LA. And I met Stuart and I went to see his plays and, and I was just very impressed. And then I, I sat, you know, we had dinner at his apartment and, you know, and talked about horror movies and stuff. And he already had a uh, 50 page uh, script for a broadcast television pilot for Reanimator. Wow, that's weird. So I said, I said, but it wasn't what we had for the movie. It was oh yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> it was. It didn't have Doctor Hill in it. It oh, okay. just went up to the point where Halsey gets killed. So okay. that was it. And so you know, I think with play, first of all, it was just an hour, but also with plays, um, you know, plays are very short. You know, there's not as much content. I mean action wise than a, than a movie because people actually, you can't just cut from scene to scene. People actually have to walk around to do stuff. 
Um, so I think there was a sensibility of that there. It was very strong on the dialogue. And the, but I, I was all on board and I said, well, you know, I said that if he wanted to do it as a feature, which is all I was interested, then let's do it. So I got an option and we developed it into a feature, brought in the, the Dr. Hill character, um, be, basically because I, I had never read the stories. And when I read them, I said, hey, there's a guy carrying his head around. You know, it, I remember the 50s with all, you know, I always liked movies where heads talk and the brain yeah. is provided. That to me is horror, you know, yes. or House on Haunted Hill. Yeah. That I find the head in his closet. And so I said, yeah. And so I said, let's put this guy in it. And, um, and so that, and, and it was, you know, he was a colonel, he was a pilot in the stories, you know, but we, but Stuart, the writers, Dennis Paoli and Stuart and Bill Norris, they made him be the bad guy at the school, at the, at the call, at the medical school. So he became the, the grant machine and all this. I think that, I think the script is, is, really a great adaptation of the story you know people think it's not that it isn't like the story but i think it just absolutely is a great it's, adaptation it's 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 amazing it's like you know growing up you know mom and pop video shops um just watching just seeing that box cover for reanimator uh just seeing jeffrey combs and then you watch the movie it's pure like for a movie to come out in 85, the only thing I could think of that was kind of that crazy was Evil Dead. Um, Cause yeah. even, even Dead Alive was still seven years away. Um, so, I mean, like, how did you- yeah, I think that, I think the other one at that time was Return of the Living Dead. 85, yeah, I think yeah. That one, that, that same time. Yeah. I, I, Cause I remember when we had our cast and crew screening for Reanimator, Dan O'Bannon was there sh telling Bob Greenberg that he said, oh, that's our competition. Of course, his movie was being distributed, was paid for and being distributed by a, what, what I guess we would call kind of a mini major, an independent major, whereas Reanimator, I just made. And I, I used um, Charlie Band's offices and his, and his post deals because he owed me all this money. So that was the only way to get it back was to just have them bill him. And then I, I, I had read in books that you gotta have distribution. And so he had a sales company. And so I gave him the right to sell it. Of course, the, the problem came when he didn't give me any of the money. <laughs> so, so instead of becoming millionaires, we, I, well, a millionaire, I was left trying to explain to my investors that I, I wasn't getting any money. And so I had to sue them and the whole, oh, whole wow. ring but, oh, that, but that's the Hollywood story, you know, it's, you yeah. know, it's, I mean, this, this is like for this, it's the forever story of LA, of Hollywood. That's the story. If you come in with your, with your wall, your bag full of money and, and wanting to get into the movies, so you get, totally taken advantage of and you go home. <laughs> That's how it works. What? I was lucky because Reanimator was um, really, really good. Yeah. You know, it was really good and it was really different because, because Stuart directed it like, I mean, he, his sensibility was theater. So he had this ability of suspension of disbelief in a way that you don't usually get in movies. There's the the acting, the way the actor that were directed was was very superior to anything you saw in the genre that wasn't like, you know, The Shining or, you know. You're right. You know, you're for right. a cheap horror movie. You're and so right. Balls to the wall kind of gore and and um, exploitation. And that was Certainly Stuart liked the shock, but I was really worried because as a horror fan, I knew that um, that I would see, I would watch a bad horror movie. I still will. I'll watch a bad one 
if it just kind of goes <laughs> over the top. <laughs> over the top is great. Did you have and a lot of problems with the rating boards when you were? I just, I just, I owned it. I didn't have to give it to them. I didn't give it to them. Yeah. If I'd given it to a studio to to distribute, it would have been totally different, of course. But I just didn't. I knew that they would cut the shit out of it, so I just didn't do it. Yeah. And of course, that also meant that it didn't do a tremendous amount theatrically. And I don't know if it even would have if it had a if it had a real push behind it, because I'm just not sure that the sensibility of it fit the fit the mark. You know what I mean? The main street. I mean, something like Nightmare on Elm Street is is a you know that's really mainstream. It's like a Halloween movie. Yeah. Um, the um, Evil Dead was more of a video sensation than theatrical. Uh, the first time I saw it, it was on video. I didn't see it in the, in the theaters until later. Um, Texas Chainsaw came out when the, um, you know, that was kind of the drive-in era. So also with uh, Night of the Living Dead. And I think Night of the Living Dead really benefited from the, um, from the, um, from the copyright error they made. So you know that they didn't affix the proper copyright on the positive print. And so it went into the public domain. <laughs> they lost the movie. They lost wow. the, they didn't have any rights. And that meant that when, I mean, it was quite, I saw it when it first came out and it was, I mean, now it looks like a Saturday afternoon matinee, but it was really strong, you know, when it like what is it 69 or something uh, and I, yeah. but but then when um w when video started up that's when it became so famous mm. because it was a because anybody could put it out so it's the same thing with with the um it's a wonderful life i don't think it's a wonderful life it wasn't a hit it wasn't a success when it came out and it fell into the public domain. And if it hadn't done that, um, it wouldn't have been on TV everywhere. And it wouldn't, and everybody put out their version of It's a Wonderful Life because they didn't have to pay for it. They just needed to get a print that they could transfer to video. And that may put it, that made it ubiquitous. And, and it was, I think it really helped it become a classic. And the same thing for Night of the Living Dead. Movies get lost when they when they can't be seen. I mean, even you know, now, think of, some, of course, think of yeah. something. Like, I mean, most of my movies, not that they all deserve. I think that they're so great. that Everybody should watch them. I do. <laughs> pretty, I do. pretty, you know, limited, you know, mixed. But they certainly um, you know, it's from beyond, you'll never see that, you know, MGM, it's in MGM's library. They, you know, MGM, you know, these studios, movies are like real estate to them. It's what they, it's what they get their, their loans based on. It's collateral for their operating loans. And the, the business of like taking a little, you know, an old movie and churning it and getting it out that's not part of you know there's no reason for that you know i mean that i remember i at one time about 10 years ago i went to, to lionsgate and they had they had the distribution rights for bride of reanimator and beyond reanimator and reanimator had just come free and so i went to them and said hey do you want a licensed reanimator and you can put those three out in a box and do this and that you could make make a kind of a meal out of it sure they were they were not only not interested the the rights to bride of reanimator which i also own were coming due and they didn't even re-up it wow. didn't even bother and you go boy if i had the rights to those if i i, I don't own beyond reanimator but if i had those three I'd have a box set out with yeah. lots and lots of, uh, you know, the arrow release and, and it's not a, 
of course, this is a different era. Now it's just collectors, right? Sure. But in the 80s, that's not what it was. No. In the 80s, it was millions of dollars off releases. You know, even a just a kind of a not very interesting horror movie could sell 30, 40,000 units, 50,000. You know, it wasn't. And though, and back then, the the wholesale price of a VHS to a video store was almost seventy dollars. Yep. You know, because because they're taken into account that it's going to be rented out. Yeah. And if you bought it yourself, it was like thirty dollars. You know, for a VHS. You yeah. Know? The I first would go VHS. The first VHS I ever bought, and I was the first one I knew that it was a Beta because Betamax came first. Yes. Um, was a uh, was eighty dollars because I found a place that sold all you could buy was blank tape and 90 minutes of blank tape was like 20 bucks and I found this little store that didn't sell many it wasn't like a real video store and mainly they just sold porno and I bought a porno movie for $80 a VHS wow $80 (laughs) (laughs) this is and this is and this is 1979. <laughs> no, no, no wonder they look so fancy back then, those porn stars. <laughs> um, well, that was, that was when they were trying to make um, corn, not in 79, it was already, I think, going down. But, you know, with, uh, with the Deep Throat and beyond, Behind the Green Door and these moves, there was a point in the 70s were thing off of the end of the 60s where things were just kind of the pieces that all come come apart and there was this idea that um porn could just be another genre mm. and if you went to the a movie theater to see a kung fu movie they would show you an explicit trailer for a, a hardcore porn movie but the porn movie wouldn't would be like the opening of Misty Beethoven, you know? Yeah, yeah. There, the story there's... of O, which wasn't actually hardcore, but there, there was this idea that this was going to, that, por- that hardcore sex would just be part of the, you know, just part of going to a movie. And people kind of, you know, it, it wasn't like, you know, thought, well, I guess that's what's gonna happen. And of course it didn't, it, it went the direction of um, when it hit VHS and it just, they quit making the big productions. They tried to make like a real movie with, with explicit sex. And then it just went towards the kind of speedy side of things, which probably was, was predictable, I think, because especially since a lot of it was, you're dealing uh, with, you know, kind of sexual exploitation of one sort or another. And then it ended up getting into being less and less production value, more and more explicit, or just, you know, sex bits. And I think it's come totally full circle now. I mean, not full circle, but it's gone all the way over to where now it's just regular people doing it. You know? <laughs> it's sort of democratization of porn. And, and I think porn is more accepted now than it's ever oh, been in, at least in modern Western history. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so from- In talking about, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. No, 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 go ahead. You. But in talking about the uniqueness of uh, the reanimate, how different it was of everything at the time. And I think that it really comes from the, the source of the HP Lovecraft material. And as someone who's adapted, I know from beyond was a, just a Lovecraft short story that you you adapted, but you, what, what are the challenges in bringing Lovecraft to the screen? Because nobody did it better than you guys. And I've seen a lot of, of people fall short. And uh, is it the imagery he uses? It's very verbose. Is it like, what, could you speak on that? Um, I think that the typical answer to that, the, the regular uh, sort of answer is that a lot of what he describes, if you see it, it's not going to be scary Mm. you know his his stories were very much about the words they're they're not you know his his stories often 
they didn't have, it's not like a Stephen King story or a, um, who is it that writes the vampire ones? I forget her name. Anne Rice. You know, Interview with the Vampire. Yeah, Anne Rice, which I think are the modern, kind of the modern, kind of main, I guess they're mainstream horror, of course. But Stephen King, if you read his novel, a horror novel, you're, you're reading kind of a description of a movie, you know? Everything is images and it's very, you know, he describes, you know, he'll fill up a page with just real products that the, you know, he's using Ajax and he's, you know, things are very much like what you would see on a screen and the stories are almost written as things that you can imagine, especially, you know, of course he goes like anybody writing a novel, it goes pretty much further, but they definitely are things you could see Whereas Lovecraft didn't do it, you know, he wrote, it's almost like the words were, you know, more, you know, prose poem or something. They were, it's very archaic in a way, the way he wrote. And it was, and it was, the plots are hard to decipher usually. And there's not a lot of characterization. There's, and quite frankly, there's not a love interest generally. And that was one of the big things that Stuart and Dennis and Bill did is that they, you know, they created the character of Meg. They made a love story with the narrator. The narrator in the original stories doesn't even have a name, right? And so the idea was having a love story is almost, you know, it's, it's pretty critical for most stories, you know. So it, there's no, it's not very personal. And a lot of stuff that Lovecraft deals with is very kind of cosmic. Now he has some great setups and the stories that have, that have kind of gimmicky stories that work would be, you know, be something like the, the Dunwich Horror, the, you know, the, um, of course, Reanimator had a progression of stories, but they were like, reanimator stories are not like Lovecraft. It's very right. un-Lovecraft and we think of the cosmic horror of Lovecraft. Huh. So I think it's I think it's very tricky and I think I think it's very, you know, not, you know, most people I think when they write a script, they try to they write a script based on movies that they like. So if you were going to write a script, you'd probably want to write something that was like whatever the movies were that you loved when you were 12 years old or something, you know, um, you would, I want to see that, you know, <laughs> I want to do something like that. And like for me, well, for me, you know, I was, I wanted something like the, like the Corman Poe movies on reanimator, you know, that's why I put the, um, the credit sequence all colorful like that. I, know, love that. I love that. I love that. And, you know, the modern thing, even then, was going towards don't put credits up front, you know. But I wanted to have this little mini movie credit sequence. Um, I, I, um, I didn't, you know, for me, that, those were the things I saw when I was very, at a very at a impressionable age. Is, is the Corman Poe thing kind of like also how you... You, you know, you used combs and cramps. You had that crew that kind of they, they did that a lot, right? Reading. No, no, that's that was that was more Stewart because yeah. Stewart comes from Stewart comes from um, theater, and in theater you have a troupe, mm. and your troupe you have all this group of actors. It's like a family, and they get the new play, and then they get their part. Mm. You know, yeah. they yeah. hand out the parts. That's the tradition of a theater. For me, I don't have any of that background, but it's very, very um, logical, very normal that when you work with actors that work out, you like to go back to when you're trying to do a new project, you, you want to go with people that you can depend on hopefully you broke. Can get yeah. the magic again so yeah. when i did when i started the fantastic factory project in spain 
I was trying to get people to come. I was trying to get scripts. I was trying to, and so one of the things I like when I made um, when I had a few scripts, I had I had um, um, Faust, which was a script that uh, a, a friend of mine had um, developed uh, in conjunction with Stuart. It's based on a this very extreme comic book, Faust, Love of the Damned. And, um, and Stuart at one point was going to direct it. And then I had Dagon, which was a script that I had, had, had gotten Dennis Paoli to write for me back in 86. Mm. Uh, it's a version of Shadow Over Innsmouth. So I had that in my pocket and I hadn't been able to get it made. And, um, and so, and I had a couple, of, and then I had the Andre animator, which didn't even have a script. Was it Arach had, Arachnid maybe? Yeah, yeah. And well, Arachnid was, yeah, because I thought that we needed something that wasn't strictly horror. Okay. But it, I, giant insect movie, I think is always good, you know, to round it out, you know. Yeah. And it's usually better for television and stuff. That, yes. You know, because nobody, you know, it's not, you know, a good horror movie can be very um, offensive to a lot of people or they're just, it, it doesn't entertain them. And especially on television or something. So we wanted something that would be, you know, easy, more mainstream, easier to, to deal with. And, um, and doesn't have anything that anybody's going to be censoring or squawking about. No, a big, a big, anyway, sp a big spider always works. Yeah. But anyway, the, um, the, when I started, I called Stuart because I thought I got to get Stuart over here because I, you know, it's not, he's not, I'm not part of the troop or anything, but we've done, we've worked together and had it turn out well. And I just, I asked Stuart, I said, I said, here's the, Look at do you want to direct um, Faust or do you want to direct um, Dagon? And he said Dagon. I said okay, then I'll do Faust. And I called Jeffrey for Faust because I was starting with Faust because I didn't even know if we were going to able to pull this off with all Spanish crew and and uh, trying to make Barcelona look like an American. We, I wanted it to seem like it, it was American movie, but we're using Spanish subsidies and. Spanish crew and the sensibilities are just different, especially back then. Um, and I didn't really know if we could pull it off. The effects are totally different there, the stunts, all that kind of stuff. And, um, and so on Faust, I, I thought, well, I'll do the first one because, because that way I don't have to negotiate with a director because um, that's always a big part of producing. <laughs> and and also, it's not easy working in another country, especially when you're not, most people, when they go make a movie in another country, it's basically a US crew, you know, it's a US production that gets support over there. And they, you, you're coming into kind of a more familiar situation. Whereas when I um, shot, in um, in Spain, there was none of that. I was just in Catalonia, you know, and I was working inside a Spanish company, a Catalan company. And so nobody's speaking English, you know, first of all. And the, it, it's, you know, a lot of people are very uncomfortable when they go to another, to try to live in another country. It's really, it's, it's really not, uh, it can make them feel very nervous. And, um, and so that's, so I just thought, well, I'll do it. And then when I was going to do it, I thought, well, who am I going to, I can bring a couple actors over. I'm going to have to find all these Spanish actors and then dub them or revoice them or whatever, because I can't just bring all, I've got to include you know, I got to make it a Spanish production. Yeah. And I called Jeffrey and I said, I gave him the script. I said, what part do you want to play? <laughs> so that's kind of like that troop thing. Yeah. You know, 
And he said, oh, I never get to play the detective. And I said, okay, you play the detective. You got it. <laughs> it was written, the guy's supposed to look like Elvis, you know, but I figured, fuck that, and you know, I'll get Jeffrey ah, over here. Yeah. <laughs> but, so that's kind of a, that's sort of a troop thing, but it's not the troop that, of, in Stewart's version, the theatrical version. In fact, on Reanimator, at first, I was going to go to Chicago and produce it in Chicago at the Organic Theater, but the board of directors didn't want to do it. And so I, we said, well, we'll go back to LA and do it there. And Stuart wanted, you know, he wanted to cast it from his Organic Theater actors. And I think a number of them were kind of unhappy that Stuart goes to make his feature and they weren't, they weren't a part of it because yeah. I insisted on us doing just a typical casting situation. They, they, I had met them, but they weren't, they weren't people I had worked with for 10 years and felt like I had a, yeah. any kind of obligation to. I just looked at it like, you know, I want to make a Hollywood movie and I'm going to do it the Hollywood way. So that, Stuart does have that. That thing, yeah. He definitely always tried to do that, and he always tried to make everybody he worked with, every every production, kind of be a family. And I, 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 I don't know. I mean, there is a lot of um, there is some of that that goes on on a production, and maybe it does more on big movies where. The shooting schedule is like four months long or something. But when you're doing these movies in 20, well, back then we'd get, you know, I mean, reanimated was done in 16 days, right? Wow. Um, or there'd be 20 days or 30, 30. I think society was 20 something. Um, you're working six days a week in the, at least in LA, we used to, we did it back then. We'd work six days a week and work 11 hours a day. And yeah, there's a lot of, um, you know, people get to know each other a certain way, especially parts of the parts of the crew who aren't constantly on right on set. Most of the crew of a movie production is just sitting around generally because they're waiting to be called. It's like being, I guess I never was, but I think it's like being in the military. Most of being in the military is sitting around being bored. Yeah. <laughs> I've it's seen not, full metal jacket. Like oh, <laughs> yeah. but, the, but that's the way a movie set is. It's kind of like if you visit a movie set, if you don't have a job on it, it's the most boring place <laughs> in the world. I mean, it is just knocked down dead boring. You know, if you have a job, then you're stressed. Yeah, you know, and that stress keeps you from being bored. What, what, but, what? But a lot of people are just sitting around. They did the costume. Now they're waiting, and the, they're going to be shooting that scene for three hours, four hours, five hours, and and they are not going to unless a problem. There's a problem. They need something and call them. They're sitting in the wardrobe tent, and you know, I mean, it's there's a lot of waiting around in a movie set, so. Mm -hmm. You, um, I forgot what, how we got there. Yeah, no, that's fine. <laughs> on to that you, topic. You, um, you, you went from Reanimator to From Beyond to then working on Dolls. I mean, like these are pretty iconic movies for people like us that grew up on this, like on these movies, like this this eighties horror thing that we love. Um, and then from there, how did you decide that you wanted to direct a movie in in, in society? Well, I think that. Um... It was a couple. Uh, one thing was that we did the first. I, I made Reanimator. I made the mistake of letting Empire sell it. They didn't pay the money, and I had to spend a god awful amount of money suing them. Well, before I got to that point, we were making. I mean, from the time we when I when we finished Reanimator. It was like, you know, May of 85. At that time, I made a deal with Empire, with Charlie Dan, 
to do two more, two, three movies. And back then it was like, you do a three picture deal at Cannes. We were, we were at Cannes, we did the premiere of, of, of The Mark of Cannes. We did the premiere of Reanimator, it was crazy successful. And so Charlie said, let's do three movies. And we made a deal to do three movies, me and Stuart. Okay. And um, I mean, what he wanted was Stuart, not me, <laughs> he wanted the director. <laughs> and, um, and, and so we were gonna, so we were gonna do another Lovecraft one. And I went to try to find out what else was in public domain. And I had a couple of things that I thought were interesting. One was the you know, Dreams in the Witch House, which I always thought could have been really good. And the other was um, From Beyond. Um, and From Beyond had the advantage of having a machine in it. Dreams in the Witch House doesn't have that focus. It's more about angles and you know sacrifice and stuff. And so the idea of a machine just gives you something to fo you know, it kind of gives that little sci-fi edge, you know. I you know, I always say that if a movie is, is a a thriller, it has it, it makes you afraid, you know, as suspense. But if you add fluid, blood or goop or or pus or whatever, then it's horror. Because usually horror has has mm. some something dripping, <laughs> something yeah. physical, decaying, you know? And then if you add, if you make, if you put metal in it, then it's sci-fi. You know? right. <laughs> so I think if you, with From Beyond, it kind of also had that sci-fi element. So all of a sudden you're into, it's not just, it's not just, just a horror movie, but you follow what I'm saying. Now you're in the world where you can have monsters and such, you know? And, um, and so we went with that, but we decided to, um, we decided, so then what we just, so then the other thing was, I had always heard that if a director's very successful with their first movie, their second one's gonna be a bit of a dip. And so then the idea was let's do From Beyond Second. And Charlie had a project that Ed Naha was writing called Dolls. And he had a picture of the doll with the yep, eyes. Yep. And, um, and so we said, okay, let's do that. And it's like a fairy tale movie. It's totally different, you know? And, um, and, so the, um, and so then within three months, from, I moved my family to Rome because Charlie had just gotten, a, uh, gotten the old Dino De Laurentiis studios there. Wow. And we we're going to shoot the two movies back to back, just make one set, you know, and then transform it for the other because they both had houses and they both had two story houses. And it's real expensive to build sets that are like with stairs and all that. And so we thought, well, we'll just build the set and then we'll transform it for the next movie. And before we edit the first one, we'll shoot the second and so that's what we did we dolls and actually dolls ended up being finished after from beyond you know it took longer because it you know um there uh, there had to be added the stop motion part of it which um which was um which takes time you know? yeah for sure yeah, but yeah. anyway but that's uh, but from beyond was just a short story and on that one we kind of brought it we took it from scratch, you know, and, and um, the whole short story, we used it up before the title sequence. You know, that's the short story is, uh, you know, getting his head twisted off. And, and then it's a completely invented story. It's really, it really, it uses the, the sort of the setup or the theme or the gimmick of the Lovecraft story, but it's, there's no, if you read from beyond, there's no um, Dr. Michaels or, you know, there's no, um, you know, no detective and there's, you know, there's that's, and the, the, there's no brain eating or pineal gland sticking out or, you know, and I think that what Stuart liked about it was the idea of being able to have this going into this beyond, you know, going into this other world, that the world changes and now you're going 
you're going into it. You know, there's monsters, but if you turn off the machine, they're gone. And that's a fun gimmick. And, um, and so that was, we thought that was going to be hugely successful. And Empire, because Empire paid for both of those. They totally financed them. And they, um, and they made a big, of course, you know, by the time we were towards the end of shooting from beyond in, in um, Rome, um, by that time I had, ha I realized the problems with the reanimator income. And so I had to tell Charlie that I had taken out a lawsuit. Wow. And so then we kept going, but it got more, you know, it was, things changed. And, um, what, and what, I, what? at that time I was developing Robo Jocks, which was going to be the third movie. So I was doing Robo Jocks. And then finally, I just decided that I had to bail. I just said, you know, I can't, I can't do this. It just is too odd for people who put up money for Reanimator to see me working with someone that didn't pay. Absolutely. Yeah, and yeah. So then I, so then I left. And at that point, I still worked with Stuart, but Stuart stayed with Charlie. Then I tried to do, but by that time we had already gotten interest in the treatment rewrote for Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. So we were already dealing with Disney and we, and then, um, and then I started working on a project with Dan O'Bannon. And I'd, I already had, a, I had Dagon set up all financed to shoot in Wales, England. And when I took it to Stuart, he said, well, no, I'm going to do RoboJocks instead. And so then all the financing, when I already had the script and the whole thing, and it was a good, but way better budget than, than the Empire budgets. But then all of a sudden I didn't have the finance. And then I worked with Dan O'Bannon on a project called The Men, about a man who discovers all, a woman who discovers that all men are aliens. And I worked with him for nine months and we got it all worked out. We got a treatment. And then I got the financing from this company in New York. And um, at the last minute, Dan, he was going to direct. And then Dan um, kind of bailed. And so I was left in the position of going, man, I, I can't survive these I got a family yeah I can't survive losing directors and so I decided I would just direct but also anybody who's worked on a movie set almost everybody <laughs> at one point you go you know I'd like to try directing yeah you know that can't I, he's not doing such a great job and um and so I think it's natural. You want to give it a shot. You know, you want to try directing. And so that's what, so then I. Society. Made yeah. What, what so I was, made a deal to do two movies. Two movies. Because okay. My friend, my friend had started up a company back then in the eighties with video. There was tons of little companies and you could do your own sales. You could, you could do, you know, you could do this. You could, you didn't have to go to Netflix or somebody like that, you know? And you could go sell at the market. You could sell at the international. The video was doing real well back then, and um, and so he had were, he had been the head of Empire's um, foreign sales. He's a Brit, and then he spun off. And his friend, also a Brit, Paul White, lived in Tokyo and worked there. Had a family there, and he all the, at that time the, the Japanese just had you know, lots of money. And so he was get he got financing from them to do a company called Wild Street Pictures and they were doing super low budget movies and then taking them to market or they're just starting. And when I saw that, it was just another one of those Corman things for me. And I thought, well, hey, let me, I wanna, I started, I went to their sets. I was really, I said, let me do, let, let me work with you. And I have the rights to the Reanimator sequel. And so I'll do the sequel with you, but I want to, I want to be totally in control, produce, direct, write, the whole thing. I don't, you know, but because that was a real, that was something of value, you know, the sequel. 
And I could have taken, you know, you could go to a studio with it or something, you know, but, but I need to do two pictures to direct. And I want Bride of Reanimator be the second one because since I'm totally ignorant and have never taken a film class or have any yeah. reason to be doing this, I thought I may just fail completely, you know. What's to say? I've never directed actors or you know, all I know is what I learned from from producing, from yeah. being on a set. I just watch. Yeah. That's all I know. And so I figured I'd give it a shot, but I wanted to make sure, you know, I you know, I a French distributor once told me that the first time directors usually make two movies in one. Their first and their last. <laughs> because, you know there's a lot of promise until you actually have the movie and then yeah. there it is. You know? It's a very ambitious way, thing for your first film. Oh, yeah. Right. No, I'd say it. Langan. No, I'm just saying. So that was the, the scheme was to do was to do two movies and I figured if the first one was a, a fl terrible, I still had, I could still get another chance. What, what was what was what was it about the society script that that called to you um, or like it, another thing too? like I feel like that movie has really gotten its legs with every decade that passes. What do you think is it that 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 like maybe just people well, discover the film? What it, what attracted me was that I had just spent nine months in the paranoid world uh, in the paranoid world of the men. Oh, which is a similar ironic twist, right? Okay. In the man, a woman discovers all men are aliens, you know, and it's got graphic, crazy stuff, and it's got this cultural irony, satire, and it's got this dark, paranoid world where she starts realizing that there's something going on in this world that she never knew was there, but it's right there. And so when Rick Fry and Keith Wally, I, um, Woody Keith gave, I mean, I was just going to my office and they gave me a script, you know, and I read it. And from the beginning, I said, this is the man. This is that same, I've been, I've already been seep, steeped in this. I've been, I've been in this paranoid world for nine months and now, well, here's, here it is again. It's just this time it's, in a family, it's a, I mean, it's like incest, it's, it's a, it's still a secret society, secret world that, that you think you're crazy, this couldn't be. And it was a class thing. And the only thing was that it didn't have the shunting or any of that. So it didn't have, didn't have the fantastical stuff. It was just a blood cult. Like a QAnon thing, right? Oh my God! Yes, it was a secret. <laughs> you know, it is kind of a it is sort of a precursor. And um, but I was, you know, I love the script, but I from the very I just immediately said, well, this is great, but it's got to have some some special effects. This has to. We have to develop. We got to take this so that this is not just well cutting people's throats or drinking their blood. And so then that's when I thought, what would I like to see? I'm yeah. watching all these rubber guys and what haven't I seen? And I just thought, well, I'd like to see bodies just melding together and simultaneously um, the Japanese financers asked me to meet a Japanese um, effects artist because it would help them sell <laughs> the movie. And that was Screaming Mad George who was in LA and he is more of an artist than an, an effects artist. But when I met him, I went to his apartment and saw his art and we just watched Andalusian Dog and we looked at Dolly paintings and we immediately, I started imagining this idea that what they're doing instead of blood is that they're somehow melding together. And so I started getting the images. I, I tried to use surreal stuff like Dolly, even in From Beyond, the first poster we did, I had it based on a Dolly painting, you know, with the skull, with the little skulls and the eyes and the mouth. So it was a, 
you know, for George, it was fortuitous to meet George because um, similar to Stuart, it was somebody that I immediately had felt like I was in the same yeah. zone of and had something totally individual, totally individual to offer. And so we, that I immediately with Woody Keith and um, Woody Keith and Rick Fry, we just started talking through the whole thing and came up with this idea of the shunt and started making it kind of a class, um, a, a class system satire, a satire of, of, of politics, you know, of, the, of class. And so for me, it was like, I grew up, I went to college like at the end of the 60s and and it was all political people in the streets and stuff and everything was falling apart and and you you always had this idea that politics was fun because you were young and everything was breaking loose you know and so the idea of taking political ideas you know class ideas and making it a monster mm. I thought hey that's like inventing a new monster whoever gets to do that, that's really tough because you yeah. have to have all the rules. So I invented this whole history of the shunting that never, you don't see it in the movie because I also don't like the scenes, generally don't care for the scenes in the movie where somebody gets at a blackboard and starts explaining everything that you should just get organically, you know? And I also thought it didn't really matter because I think I always think that a movie is kind of like, or at least a certain type of genre movie is kind of like an iceberg. The part, the part you see is the movie, but under e, underneath it's all the logic and stuff. If you mm. make a movie like about vampires, you can, it's almost like a choose your own adventure. You can just choose, you know, do they disintegrate in the sun? Can they eat? Can they fly? Do they have teeth? You know, do they, you know, there's so many rules for, for vampires, right? And yeah. you can just choose the ones you want if you're doing a, a zombie thing. But that's also main. You don't have to explain anything. If you watch Night of the Living Dead, it's like such a, what could be happening? Well, now you do a Walking Dead type thing. Everybody knows all the rules and what the permutation. Do they run fast like 28 days later? Or do they slow and plodding like like Night of the Living Dead, or are they EC Comics brain eaters like Return of the Living Dead? You know, there's there's all these you're you're plugging into a a complete mythology. You know, there's variations, but with society, there was none of that. So there was in none, a yeah. sense, it was like just great because you're you're inventing it. Yeah. And of course, it was a it was a wonderful. Um, you know, like I said, there's always a group of people. I would say with um, society, it would have been Mad George and Woody Keith and myself. That's the that's the witches around the brew, because you can't imagine society without George or without Woody Keith. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So it's not like. You can't, you know, it's not like I could have done it. I could, you know, I, I know where I was put, what I wanted. I, I mean, but you don't know the form it can take. And once it starts taking a form, you keep wanting, it's almost like you're, some people say it's, it's almost like a, making a movie is like a, a discovery. And I think that's the way maybe writing a song or, or painting a picture is to a certain type of of event like that not all but um i mean if somebody says make a you know an, do an illustration for a campbell soup ad there's a little bit of discovery there but a lot of it is pretty much you know uh, set down but sometimes making a movie is, is you're just go, trying to see where you go with it yeah that, and that... sometimes that extends even to during the shoot you know it's a, and it's you a, you finished it in what eighty nine, and then it came out in Europe, and then not in the states for years later, right? Yeah, the the a company in Britain, in the UK, um, bought the North American rights, but they were a UK company. 
So what they did is they put it out in the UK and it was actually, that's where it was the most, the most successful. Of course, you didn't know back then, you didn't know what's going on in other countries. You'd get a letter, you know, or a fax. Um, you didn't know what to think. Today, you would know what's happening everywhere. Everywhere, yeah. But, um, yeah, so they didn't even put it out. And it was, a, it, you know, honestly, I was so, I was so brain addled that when I was making it, I just thought it was, you know, they, it was going to be in the number one of the top 10 movies in the box office. I thought everybody's going to love this movie. It's so great. Everybody's going to love it. And it turns out kind of not even my friends did. <laughs> I think but, it was just in, way ahead of in, its time but and in, unique. But in yeah. England, it was different in this country because I made Society and Bride of Reanimator quite close together. In this country, Bride of Reanimator was, you know, I think Fangoria gave it the Chainsaw Award for that year. So it was good. Certainly a flawed movie, but it sure had some cool stuff in it, you know, and it really tried to keep the tone in a way of the first one to kind of not veer too far. And um, society was just like, you know, and in the UK, it was the opposite. They thought Pride of Reanimator wasn't so great, but society was, it was in the movie theaters. It got a lot of attention. I think you went over also, a lot of heads with that one. But uh, when, when did you realize that Italy, had the, the cult following that it amassed? I mean, because it's, it's so Italy, it's such a great well, story. I, I'm sorry. Go I, ahead. I know, I know when I went to the festivals in Europe, Italy, France, Spain, those kinds of places, you realize that there was some, some attention given to it. And then I remember, at, like in the early 2000s, I got a, from, a, from an Italian, had written their dissertation for college on society. Mm. They sent me, it was all in Italian, I don't you know. <laughs> but it was like, wow, you know, they let you do that. But it wasn't until kind of going into the Great Recession. Mm. And I think that's when they're all of a sudden Everybody wanted a print to show. And I think also it coincided with this great interest that another, a new generation had in, in 80s movies, yeah. the VHS era. And all of a sudden after digital had kind of, it's almost like giving you, it kind of made everything animated, you know? You're right, and it you're right. It seemed like things just quit being tactile and and so much horror also got to be so pretentious and and um and i think there all of a sudden there was this renewed interest by younger people and they start looking at the 80s and being much more forgiving the 80s a lot of the movies everybody loves are pretty clunky <laughs> very clumsy clumsily done yes but there's but they 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 forgive it you know? That's the charm. And that's it's the charm. Exactly. The and so and so and so a lot of the clunkiness of society got forgiven, and they say, "Oh yeah, that's the '80s. Yeah. That's not bad acting. That's not bad storytelling. That's the '80s." And it's think of it this way: when you watch the when the J horror came, the Japanese horror um, with uh, the Ring, the Grudge, and Dark Waters, and all those. People, you watch those movies, the ones with the little girl with the hair in front of her face coming down the hallway and a little bit of that, you know. Um, they, you know, people I would watch with, my friends, they'd look at it and say, what the, why is she doing that? That is ridiculous. And they'd say, no, 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 it's the Japanese culture. It's not the Japanese culture. It just isn't, it's just like, a weakness. And I think that's the way people look at the 80s. They say, no, that was the 80s. <laughs> and I, it was the 80s. I, um, I got to say, my, I, my favorite horror movie is probably Return of the Living Dead, the first one. Um, and I remember watching the second one in the movie theater, and I was young. So to me, I love the second one. Um, then I watched a video of Return of the Living Dead 3. And after loving the first two, which were basically the same movie, only the second one wasn't as good. 
I remember watching Return of the Living Dead, and and back then when it went straight to video, like I was like, oh, it didn't get a theatrical. That's so weird. And I really hated that movie when I was like fifteen. Oh, really? <laughs> and then, but here, as I got older, I was like, I I hated the second one. And then now I watch Return of the Living Dead three more than any of the other ones. I think it's fucking brilliant. It's like my favorite. That and The Dentist are like my two favorite movies that you did. Um, and it's it's amazing. I think as I got older, I just appreciated it um, because of the practical effects. Like Steve Johnson, holy shit, man. Like everything about it, um, it was completely different. But like what, so it's a really different movie. Like what was like, what yeah. was the idea going in? Well, I think, the idea for me, uh, first off, I'll say that I think Return of the Living Dead, Dan O'Bannon was the one yeah. that, that, that showed how you can make EC horror comics in the movies. Until then, they all want to only do stuff like Creep Show and stuff like that, where they would, you know, kind of make them flat. And yeah, yeah. They'd put the comic book and... I bought those comics when I was a kid. Before I even watched horror movies, I bought, I'd get my dime and I'd get a horror comic. And those things, that's what Dan did. He showed, and without Return of the Living Dead, you've got no Tales from the Crypt on TV because nobody would have showed him how to do it. You're right. Yeah. And, and when I was, when I got the chance to do the third one, which to me, what happened was the second one was, was really underperforming. So the value of the franchise went from big to like down to the level where they would actually offer it to me. <laughs> and because it was worth nothing. And at that time, I was actually working with Trimark on the um, on Warlock 2. Oh, wow. Julian I Sands. I was direct, yeah, yeah, I was going to direct Warlock 2. And so I was working on the story for that. And, um, and then they, Mark Amin, the head of the company, he got the rights to return Living Dead 3. And he, he said, oh, you want to do this? And I said, yeah, because I'd already been trying to do it with another couple, another group of producers. And they ended up not having the rights. And I thought that so my approach, we didn't have a story or anything, but my approach was kind of like three pronged. One was that I wanted it to, um, you know, I wanted it to be true to both of the antecedents. It was, it, to me, it was, a, it was a second sequel to an alternate sequel to the movie that, that is the one that began the modern age of horror, mm -hmm. Night of the Living Dead. In, in my book, that's where, that's where this part of horror begins. That's the crux. And the writer of Night of the Living Dead um, had the rights to the title. And so Romero made Day of the Dead, he did, Dawn of the Dead. He didn't call it Dawn of the Living Dead because because I forget the name of the writer owned that. And he even wrote a book called Return of the Living Dead, which I read, I read the paperback and it had nothing to do with Return of the Living Dead. Trioxin. Yeah. I'm trying to remember if there was a gas, there might've been a gas, but it was just a bus <laughs> yeah. school season or something that crashes. And so I, um, and I had, I actually visited the set of Return of the Living Dead and Bill Stout, who was the, production designer there um, actually made me my first poster for Reanimator. Um, so so um, my feeling was I wanted it to, and Return of the Living Dead was an alternate sequel to, Do to Night of the Living Dead. I, the sequels, Dawn of the Dead, then Day of the Dead. That, those are the sequels. But the, the um, producer, that, that made Return of the Living Dead, he got the rights to make that title. And so that was what Dan O'Bannon got a hold of. And Dan 
wrote a script that was strictly in the mode of, I think, of EC Comics, that's where you get brain eating. And in yeah. EC Comics, they're always eating brains, you know, and people are running around naked for no good reason. <laughs> and, and it's very gory, you know, and Dan just made it a, um, he did, I think he did that with a lot of um, contemporary music and just did really cool effects. And, and it, on the one hand, it was really funny and, and you know, unabashedly exploitative with Linnea Quigley dancing in the graveyard and all that. Yeah. Couldn't do today, but, um, but then on the other hand, and they go more brains and all that, but then on the other hand, you have that incredible scene in the mortuary where the half yep. woman is saying, it hurts, you know, yes. the guy is changing. I mean, that was a, um, you know, that was, a, I think, of course, I think the movie falters a little towards the end, but it's incredible. It's just a, a, a really yeah. cool, cool movie, but it's an alternate sequel. He didn't follow, if you remember in Night of the Living Dead, um, you go, why are they changing? Now, I remember subconsciously just assuming that if you got bitten, you'd change. But that's not in the movie. That's something that, that somehow just made some kind of experiential sense. Do you remember? I always thought, when the brother came in, the brothers changed and the girl that we're following is there. And he, I think he bites her, he grabs her. You think that he's, um, that he's gonna change because she bit him. The little girl in the basement, when she dies, she comes back, she got, eat, she got bitten by them. Yeah. So you sort of assume that, but if you really look at the, the story, it's that they don't know why it's um I don't know what's going on here. <laughs> it's um if you look at the story they're on the radio they go we don't know a thing came back from outer space and something might have happened and we don't know why but what was happening is just anybody who was dead was coming back gotcha and they were just being cannibals if you die or you're dead you will come back to life and it, remember, the tagline of Dawn of the Dead was, when hell is full, the dead will walk the earth, which I thought was one of the greatest taglines of all time. That was the original and, name of the podcast. Yeah. Well, when you think of that, that's like really scary. Yeah. I mean, talk about apocalyptic. Yeah. Hell's yeah. full? You mean, you mean there's no room in hell anymore? That's so it. all of a sudden, the dead are just going to walk around? Great tagline. But then it became about biting and having a virus. And with 28 days later, they went all the way to the idea that this was a virus because by that time, what we're, you know, we're worried about what now we're living, the pandemic and AIDS, I think had a lot to do with it. The idea that you could think about, think about, um, you know, the um, evil dead and then the version of that that was made 30 years later was cabin fever. Yeah. And the difference between the two is that in cabin fever, the teenagers are actually renting a place that you might want a vacation at. You go to Evil Dead and you go, what the hell? Are Why in this crappy, horrible little cabin? Oh, whoop de doo you know? Yeah. <laughs> it's like the worst place in the world to go. But all it was about was that, oh, my friend is sick and I could catch the sickness from him, so I'm going to kill him. That's the logic of it. Evil Dead still had the macabre. It had maybe one of the best Lovecraft sequences on that tape recorder I've ever seen in a movie. And of course, it had incredible imagination, yeah. but it's macabre, which is the way the zombies began. They were more macabre, but... By that, by now they're just people that you know. They're you bite, you get it. You, you know, it's you're hungry. Um, so that that was sort of the, so I wanted to do something that would that would be a sequel to both Night of the Living Dead and Return of the Living Dead. Okay. And when I so when I began it, I asked Trimark, 
a couple of questions. One was on the second one, it really suffered because they made them put some characters in that were already gone and put these actors, you know, that were already dead. Same thing. I couldn't believe so, it. And so I said, do I, are there any actors or characters that I need to put in this? And they said, no, there's not. Don't have to. And then the other question I said, does it have to be funny? And they said, no, it doesn't have to be funny. And I said, well, what do you require? What are the requirements for this? They say, we got to have the trioxin gas and there's got to be brain eating. That's it. And so when I interviewed writers, because I interviewed a lot, I got a lot of pitches. And I had already decided at that time, believe it or not, 1992 or whenever, I thought there had been so many zombie movies already made that how could you do something different? Yeah. <laughs> and I thought, I want to do one where the um, where the zombie is the main character instead of being the outside threat. And secondly, off of Bride of Reanimator, I the Bride of Reanimator was kind of structured in a very loose way on um, Bride of Frankenstein, where the bride comes at the end. That's the glory of the third act, and when the bride finally showed up in Bride of Reanimator, I'd look at that movie, I thought, man, she's the best character in the movie and I didn't even have her in it for most of the movie. So in a way, Return of the Living De Dead 3 was a way to put take the character of the Bride of Reanimator and put her in from the beginning and make the movie be about her so you're not having to wait around, you know, doing all these other kind of distractions until you get to the to the payoff. And um, so that was sort of where I was coming from. And normally I'm very, doing sequels, I really want them to be very true. To pre generally, I've done, gone even worse off than that. But <laughs> I think that um, on this one, I think one reason I did, I didn't want to make it funny. And I usually make things very satirical and ironic. It's just my nature. Yeah. But for some reason on this, I got the pitch from, from, um, and I worked with, um, I, 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 um, I got the pitch from um, John Penny. And he had this, he pitched this thing about the, the opening scene with the bullet. That guy, him. that zombie was horrifying. That zombie was horrifying. I that's a real like that's when I knew it was going to be different. Like I'm watching this zombie, and it, as time went on, like I I found the movie to be kind of like off. Like I, it, it was almost like gross, but in a good way. Like it was just meant to be. Like I'm looking at the zombie, and then they 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 freeze them, and it's just man, it's it's amazing, amazing. Yeah, well, that was John. That was in John's pitch. That was his pitch. And then he had this site and then it was the kid's father and um, and the father was the colonel and the kids with this kind of punk girl and um, and they're running away and she's obsessed with death, you know, and um, and so it's kind of goth, I guess, you know, because goth goth kind of style people they kind of there's a lot of like this death sex type thing and um and i had seen a front right down the street from on franklin avenue here um which i isn't close to i remember i was driving and i saw this girl with these shorts and these she was goth and she had these um you know um silk star you know you know tights with you know, patterns and they were scratched, you know, they were cut out, you know how- 1991. Style, they cut all, they put nails through their ear and yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and, and, sh and so <laughs> I, and the boots and stuff. And I thought that's how, that's the costume yeah. that she should have. And so John had this idea of the, this kind of Romeo and Juliet story. And so we just sat down and developed it and, um, and develop the story. And I think it was, you know, and this, and I think that that script, we, I story, I 
storyboarded the whole thing and we even adjusted the storyboards for the um for the locations and i think more than any movie that of any movie that i've directed it's um it is just about exactly what was planned <laughs> usually you can't get something done and you you know you can't get that you know things screw up you can't get it, you can't do this and things change a lot but that movie basically you know followed you know followed the plan it, it, that it was kind it, of fun it might be your masterpiece um it's amazing how much i hated it as a kid and now as an adult oh <laughs> it just um it, it just the the effects the practical effects, the zombies, the 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 head with the spine. Um, geez, it's just I I can't. Any time I talk about Return of the Living Dead, I say you got to watch one and three. <laughs> well, the problem with the movie, and one reason I think why it was never much of a success, was that it just had the worst title of all time. You know, it's just horrible. Return, Return of, the, of the Living Dead 3, three. which mm-hmm. means you can't put a subtitle or anything. How, how much title can you have? Yeah. You no. know, and they wanted the three. If you didn't take that title, like in Spain, it was called Mortal Zombie, which in Spanish is a little different. But then it's like a real movie. Right. You know, it's not, you're not, you're not, um, you're not making it you know, this horrible title, um, it's just, it's just awful. But I think it's one of the best um, zombie movies, you know, and if you're going to put your top five or something, and I, and it's not, and I don't, I'm not somebody who is, is, um, who tries to gloss over the, the weaknesses in my movies. I'm very aware of the bad parts of them. But that movie is actually on its own level. It kind of it kind of hangs in there, you know. It hardly has a scene that I just kind of go, "Oh shit," you know. I gotta zap forward. <laughs> and most most of my movies are like that. I kind of oh, I can't watch this. I'll <laughs> go to the next bit that I like, you know. Uh, on a similar note, um, speaking of like you know walking into a franchise, you took up part three of this one, but uh, the Silent Night, Deadly Night series. When you came yeah. to be involved with that, <laughs> there, now was that your decision to go? <laughs> oh yeah, well, but I, I'm curious. Was it um, your decision to, to get away from that killer Santa thing to do the? Yeah, uh, yeah, on the first one. Yeah, that was something that after on this after, when we were delivering *Brighter Reanimator*, um, this guy Richard Gladstein came to see me from was called um, IT. What was the name of the the company? Uh, Miramax Video guy. Video distribution. Well, yeah, after he went, okay. after he did, after he did Reservoir Dogs, he went to Miramax. Okay. Um, he was the, he's the guy who produced that. Not the he's from the guy who he wasn't. What's his name? You know, Tarantino's partner. Yeah, but yeah. He's the guy who Green kind of got it made, and. Um, IVE, it was called then, and then it became LIVE Live. Company famous for the fact that the parent, the, the head of the company and his wife were were murdered by the two sons, remember? They oh. went to jail. Menendez? Oh. Yeah, Menendez. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was that company, which happened while I was working with that company. Wow. But um, the... Um, Gladstein was trying to get, he was an exec there and he was trying to get into production. And so he found that there's certain, he, he bought the rights to the Silent Night, Deadly Night movies and that, you know, the franchise, you know, the sequels. Sure. It got the company to agree to that. And if he only, you'd have to put a certain actor in there, you know, so like in the second and the toy one, we put Mickey Rooney. If it had this actor and the budget was at a certain level, which was today would be called the micro budget. I mean, it was way, way cheap, really stripped down. And so he said, hey, do you wanna, he wanted to get into production. 
And so he said, you want to do number four? And I said, I kind of didn't have any work. And so yeah. I kind of went, yeah, I, you know, you know, I was, I got, by then I had four kids, you know, yeah. and I was like, yeah, you know, okay, <laughs> you know, and I was at that time working with Screaming Mad George and Woody Key. And so we were like wildly out of our minds by then. And, um, <laughs> With, um, you know, with George, it was all, we were all into simulacra and all this weird stuff. And Woody is just way out there. And, uh, and Woody has a new movie, by the way, he just wrote and produced called Girl Next, which has a pretty good, um, pretty good trailer. Okay. Girl Next. Okay. And, um, and so we just, I just went totally against the Christmas stuff. I even made the main character like be a Jewish girl, and, you know, and it's kind of a, it's pretty rough. I mean, it, you know, it was not, not great. And I got but it had some really weird Screaming Mad George stuff in it. Really pretty cool. We had some pretty weird scenes, but in general it's a, and it was totally based on the myth of Lilith. And I was just way, way <laughs> gone with, with layering on ideas and the actual story just kind of didn't work. I, but the I, second one, yeah. Yeah, I wanna say, yeah, exa- I wanna say the fifth one was pretty damn good. I the like toy, the fifth one. The toy one, yeah. Yeah, and because- so by that one, Rick, I was producing The Giver and, and um, Richard Gladstein came out because the movie made money for them. It's not that, you know, and so he came and, um, and to the set and said, hey, let's do another um, another silent night. And I said, okay, I said, oh, great. I've got an idea, let's do killer toys, you know? And, um, and I, you know, and so then we, I worked with the, um, the script supervisor on Guyver, Marty Petroser, who I had met when I was looking for a project and a director before I ever came to LA, he was in New York and he had a short film I really liked. And he was now out in Hollywood. He's working as a script director, script um, supervisor. And he was fantastic at the script. Supervisor. He was incredible. And I thought, I told Richard, I said, hey, we should get him to, to direct. You know, I really kind of feel comfortable with that. And so I, I wrote the script with him and the idea and it came, did this kind of, Pinocchio story, you know, about a toy boy. I always wanted to call it toy boy. And, uh, and um, the only weakness of that movie, I think, besides it's just so damn cheap, you know, um, was that we, I think I made a, a mistake. I, I mean, I made an error in the explanation for how these toys could kill. And I tried to make it be based on this real mechanical stuff. And um, I should have just gone the Chucky way of some supernatural thing. Hmm. Because Chucky works perfectly. You don't have to make it be a mechanical doll. You can still make the toy be mechanical, the boy being mechanical. I like the like stuff in his brain and stuff. But oh, good. I just feel like by not, and the other thing was, at that point, I was still, I was working with George. And of course, on Bride of Rea, on Society, that's probably George's greatest, the greatest, um, the greatest platform to, to present his work. He generally was unable to really make it in the, you know, in the facts like KNB or somebody or Steve Johnson, because he's just, totally in his own thing. He's more of an artist than an effects guy. True artist. So there's no sense, there's no sense in getting George to get someone's head cut off or something because it, there's nothing in it for him. You can only give him the weird stuff. So on Bride of Reanimator, I didn't get him to do the bride or use, I had him do weird shit, you know, the weird things at the end because that's where, that's what he's good with. The head with the, the, the bat wings. Well, that wasn't him. That was, oh, okay. 
Yeah, that was, I'm trying to remember the name of the artist. We had like five companies on Verizon. Okay, yeah, that was uh, that was great. But I, I, I'm, I'm going to go out on the limb and I'm going to say Silent Night, Deadly Night 5 is the best out of those five movies. <laughs> Could be. And I, lo- I, I like the know, first. Did, yeah, and I was, I didn't, um, I didn't, um, after I did those two, I never watched them again, you know, I just, I just didn't bother. I think I, I think I was very disappointed. You know, it was the toys, the killer toys just weren't, I should have had somebody else do that. Or I should have had somebody else do that. Not the, not the boy, you know, I think George did great with that, you know, um, but the, and Mickey Rooney was fantastic. And the, but it was that I think I needed someone else to do the toys and I should have given it a supernatural thing. There should have been something that was that where it didn't have to be completely you gotcha. know, kind yeah. of I mean today you could do it, it could be AI, you know, you could believe that, but not back then. You know, today you could actually find a way to make it like, yeah, these toys really can kill because they have a kind of a computer artificial intelligence that you can give them a give them something to do like i robot or something but the um but the so that was a problem and the and of course i was very disappointed with the with the toys i just didn't think it was you know they were just kind of not good enough but so i never watched these movies again you know mm-hmm. i just you know I just let it go. And then about, um, I don't know, a year or two ago, I, there's this, there, the old, what on Hollywood Boulevard, there's a theater called the Egyptian theater that when I first moved here and I live, I live like five blocks from the Chinese, right? I live up and up toward, you know, across up to the hills in the residential. So that's my neighborhood. And the Egyptian was a regular movie theater back then. Now it's a, then, then it was revamped and made the American Film Inst- the American Cinema Tech. And they do, they did put in a re- they adapted it to a really top, you know, sound and picture. And they do retrospectives and, you know, restorations. And it still looks like the old Chinese with the Egyptian stuff. I mean, the Egyptian. And now I think Netflix owns it. But for the past 10 years, they've been on weekends, they'll have these series of of, um, of horror movie series, like um, this guy, Josh Miller does Friday Night Frights. And yeah. so you do a double feature and they're good because you get, because there'll always be somebody from the movie there to, to, to have a, uh, take questions in the middle. So if you like the movie, yeah, you like to go there because you can see the actors and and um, I always like to hear them talk about these old movies. That I like, you know? And so Josh would, you know, one of the one of their series, they had a they showed I think three of the Silent Night Deadly Nights, you know. And um, the third one at like 11 p.m. was part five, the 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 um, toy maker. Toy, toy maker. Yeah, yeah. And I have a, I think I have the only print, right? And they said they said, hey, would you come? Can we? You have a print? I said I've got a print. You know, you can if you get the rights. I don't have the right for you to show it, but I can lend you sure. the print. Sure. Yeah. And. Um, And so they said, oh, would you come and introduce it and do questions? And I went, oh, man, you know, 11 o'clock at night. (laughs) Takes me 10, 15 minutes to walk there. And then you got to walk back at 1 a.m. on Hollywood Boulevard, which is, you know, just too crazy. Sure. But it's and I'm I think I don't want to go out there. I don't want to just I don't want to even talk about this movie. You know, there's certain (laughs) things you just. put away you know and um but i thought come on don't be such a jerk just go do it right sure and so 
and there was actually quite a few people there. I mean, it wasn't like there was like there's like a there's like fans for everything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And and so there was, I don't know, there was like almost a hundred people or something at midnight. And so I did my my little talk. And then usually I'll watch the credits to see how everything looks and sounds. And then I'll leave, you know. And I didn't leave. I watched the whole movie and I was watching that thing going, what the fuck? <laughs> who, who ever, how ridiculous and insane is this? I couldn't believe it. And talk about a movie that is like 80s. Yeah. Boy, yeah. I mean, that is some weird stuff in that movie. And yeah. I must say it, I, you know, I thoroughly enjoyed it. You, you, you made stuff, you know, we'll, we'll wrap it up here. Um, but you made stuff, you know, that people really love, man. Like when, when I, when you responded and said you would do the podcast, I, I, it's a big deal to me. Like I was pretty nervous to talk to you. <laughs> like, you know, like we, you just made stuff that we grew up watching and we still love, like I've seen return of the living dead three and the dentist probably as many times as I've seen Pulp Fiction. So thank you for for that you know thank you for that um and just if you want to just i know you have a book coming out do you want to just talk about that in closing well i've got a (laughs) it's a you know i about i don't know 10 years ago or more um or maybe it's 15 years ago when all this priests and pedophilia was in the news i was at a festival in strasbourg and the head of the festival he was talking about he wanted to make a horror movie and you know most people who do these festivals they kind of have an idea that they'd like to make they start meeting people they do do the festival because they love the movies then they bring the movies and they got to they bring guests because that's what brings in the audience and then the um and then they start knowing people directors and actors and they realize hey this isn't a world that's so hard to get next to and um and he was saying you know how do you develop a movie and stuff and i said well i don't know Judge. in my mentality you know what i here how about this you know i remember my friend who has the amsterdam horror festival it was when you when you'd go to that back in the 90s and you know after the screenings at night, in the middle of the night you'd go to the red light district which is where all the you know, they have all the windows with all the sex workers in there, and, you know, it's, and um, it's kind of really shocking, you know, <laughs> you know, it's something we haven't seen, right, and so, and he was, and it's quite beautiful, because you're on the canals, it's a beautiful place, it's just that, in, that there's these, then there's these windows lit up with these any type fat young skinny old you know every type of of undressed woman there waiting for somebody to knock on the door and um he said you know the funny thing is is that when he took dario argento to the red light district um dario got really upset he had said this can't be this is wrong he says the Pope must do something about this, you know? And when he said that, it really struck me that, that he would, I mean, I understand the- Yeah, yeah, yeah. And all that, and, but that Italy is so Catholic, you know, and that the Pope, <laughs> the Pope should do something about this, you know? And so then when I was telling my friend about this, I said, you know, it's kind of like with these pedophile priests, I said, the Pope could be the hero. You know, he could- Yeah. He could do justice. And so then I started developing the idea. And then I talked to my, my um, by now, good friend, John Penny, who wrote Return of the Living Dead 3. That's where I met him. Okay. And I said, I have this idea of doing a, a, do a movie in which the Pope actually slays these pedophile priests, you know? But of course, it can't be the real Pope. So it'll be a seminary um, dropout who dresses up like the Pope and kills him. And so we developed this whole I love this it. whole idea. I love and, it. Um, and so we wrote the script. And then we went, well, we can't get this script made because nobody reads the script anyway. 
And normally, almost all the movies I've ever made in my life, it's been because somebody already had the money and said, let's make a movie. Sure. I could make society, but it could be any movie. I had to find something. Return of the Living Dead 3 was the title. The Dentist was a title, you know. Um, you get the money and then you make the movie. If you kind of develop, you know, this whole idea of making, most people feel I'm going to write a script and all people see how good it is, but nobody reads the script and they don't see it. And, and it has to be something. And so we did the script and we thought it was a lot of fun. You know, it sort of starts as a psycho killer movie and it ends up like a superhero origin movie, you know? And it's with a lot of like, the Da Vinci Code in the middle, okay. and so, yeah. so he, um, so then I said, well, what we should do is um, we should do a comic book or something. But in the meantime, I was sitting around and I thought, well, I'm just going to write. I'll write it as a novel. You know, I had gone to one of these ten day, um, <laughs> ten day kind of meditation retreats where you just you can't talk to any you just sit and meditate for like 10 hours a day for 10 days and don't talk to anybody and stuff and it's really almost drives you crazy you know it's like taking psychedelics but without the drugs you know you just it's a extreme thing um but afterwards i just had all this energy i was like just totally full of energy so i thought well i'm going to write this I'll write this as a novel. So I just started doing it and, and wrote, wrote it as a novel, which was then a, um, ended up changing a lot, filling out, doing a lot more than what was in the script, because in a novel, you have to, there's, you go many more places, you know, and it got much, you know, went back to the Middle Ages. <laughs> yeah. It's a whole kind of uh, Da Vinci Code type of thing, but had the same structure as the script. And then we even decided to do a comic book. And we did do the first issue. We didn't publish it. But we got Richard Rapporce to draw it. You know who he is? No. He's the guy who did Frankenstein's Army, the director of Frankenstein's Army. Love that movie. And, that's a, that's he, one of the best he, found footage movies ever made. Yeah, and he, I worked with him on some projects. He's Dutch. And um, he did the, of the movies that I directed in Spain, he did the credit sequences. And he was, he did concept art and storyboards for Faust. So I know him real well. And so he did, he's an incredible artist. So he, I did the, I did the first pencils and then he did the, he kind of took that and and did it more artistically and we got color and all this and and so that the comic book was different from the novel or the script because each one of them has a different there's a different style of storytelling for each medium you know okay. it's like if you look at the batman animation animated tv show from the from 15 years ago it was like wow this is so totally different from the Batman movie or a Batman comic book. I think the, you know, every medium has its own type of storytelling. So anyway, I wrote that and we were trying to use that as a way to make it be like, hey, this is an IP. Everybody wants an IP, right? Intellectual property. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, you can't just have something that's not connected. And I mean, this was like 10 years ago, right? And so I thought, well, we'll do a photo shoot of the Pope, you know, for the, for the cover of the novel. And I'll try to get the novel published so that we all can go to the market to, to the film market to, and we'll have a comic book and we'll have a novel and a movie poster and a script. Right. So it'll look like, Oh, this is a real something. And, um, and so we did the art and, and then I tried, I was, I knew that, I wasn't, I didn't send it to publishers or anything because I figured nobody's gonna, you know, I mean, I don't wanna be, you know, all you know is you'll get a lot of rejections. Who gives a crap, right? Sure, yeah, yeah. But, but a friend of mine in Italy that I was working with um, that I had done a comic book with called Horrorama. 
So I did an anthology comic with him. And I was talking to him about doing the comic, but then he thought that he could get the, you know, he found me a publisher in Italy for the, um, for the book. So I did get, I did, I did get it published in Italy and in, in cool. France. Wow. You know, they, I mean, they translated it and all that. And, um, and, but, you know, it's, it wasn't by that time it was, uh, you know, going to the market with it. I don't know. We never, Oh, it so never, it's, it's it never time. And, I, well, I wanted, you know, so it, it was published there. It was published in Italy and it was published in France. Didn't do anything. But now there's a uh, friend of mine who worked, um, who actually did Clive Barker's, did all the merchandising and stuff for Clive Barker's, com for Clive, I mean, his company was sure. this guy and another guy in the house next door to Clive that he had bought. And um, so uh, Mark Miller, he has a company called Encyclopedia Apocalypse, I think. And he's doing audiobooks. So he's, he's doing audiobooks and John Penny, who wrote Return of Living Dead 3, um, had developed, had, we, he, we took the Pope and made it into a novel. So he said, oh, I'm going to take a couple of my scripts and make them, and scripts that aren't made, well, I'll make a novel out of them yeah. and, um, and put them on eBooks. And so he did a couple and then he read, he did the narrating for, for Mark. And Mark has a business now of doing this. And Mark said, oh, I can get you a, a, he read the Pope. He said, I'll get you a publisher for that. So we got this um, Crossroads publisher who does, does Clive stuff. It has a huge bunch of people. So they, I just, so they're going to put it out. Put it here, out, yeah. Probably on ebook and probably like, I think now they do, um, they'll do paper on demand, you know. If you, you know how you can, yeah, they yeah. don't just like print a whole bunch of books. I yeah. think they do it, uh, uh, you know, As, they yep. get it all, get the program all together. And so I don't, I'm not sure how that works, but I don't expect much out of it. It's been a while since I wrote it. But I, is, is, is there like a release know. date? It, is there like, I, think, I, I thought it was going to come out in March. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think so. I okay. mean, I just got, actually just yesterday, they sent me, a file of the edit and said for me to review and you know where they have it all laid out and stuff. I don't know, but anyway, I'll put the links up and uh, you there know. There it is. Listen, <laughs> they Brian, can they can buy the Pope, you know, and hopefully it'll get to be a movie. And in Brian, the meantime, if you send me uh, any kind of an announcement of this podcast, I can always put it up. Yeah, I'll, I'll put it up. I follow you with my band and the podcast on Instagram. Okay. So, um, yeah, I'll, I'll put it up on Monday. And uh, thank you. Thank you so much for doing so much. it. This, sure. My this, pleasure. This thank you it. for all your films, though. They raised me. Thanks a lot. <laughs> <laughs> all right, cool. Thank you. See ya. Bye. Bye-bye.